all participants and presenters join us this morning. So we'll be starting now. And uh, once more, we are, we are all excited to have you all join today's uh, global webinar on COVID-19 digital certificate. This is actually the first uh, webinar on this topic that has been organized by DICE and co-hosted by the WHO and UNICEF. And to accommodate people from different time zones, we actually split, uh, split the webinar into two. Yesterday, we had the first section, and today, this is the second section in this series. And we're excited to have our panelists join today. So for today, we have uh, different speakers from different organizations who will actually be you know, speaking on different topics around COVID-19 digital certificates. We have speakers and experts in the field from the WHO, from the UNICEF, as well as speakers from countries who will be sharing their country experiences on the digital documentation of COVID-19 certificates. We have the Philippines today, and they will actually you know, walk us through their experiences on this uh, COVID-19 digital certificate. My name is Sonny Ibeneme. I'm a digital health specialist working uh, with the UNICEF, IPRO, Bangkok, Thailand. Um, before we start, let's have some housekeeping rules, please. Remember to be on mute if you are not speaking. And please remember to use the Zoom Q &A, uh, chat box to type your questions. We recommend you type your questions as the presenters you know, are presenting. At the end of the entire presentations, we we'll take all the questions and they will be answered by the top topical presenters. Most of the questions will actually be answered online as you type your questions. So we're excited to have you. Uh, please, next slide. And uh, with that, I'm going to quickly walk us through what we are going to cover today in this uh, webinar. We will start off with an opening remarks, which will be delivered by Dr. Devi. Next, our uh, topical expert will actually walk us through on some of the ethical considerations and justifications for establishing COVID-19 digital certificates. We will later highlight the, some of the technologies and the legislations required for establishing uh, the digital, the COVID-19 digital certificates. Then uh, we have we we'll take an overview of the minimum you know, data requirement for establishing the, and deploying the certificates. Next, we now have uh, a technical overview of some of the resources available to support countries in uh, deploying and scaling these uh, certificates. Then the country office from the Philippines will come and share the experiences on this digital documentation of COVID-19 certificates. Next slide, please. And with that, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Devi to give us an open remarks. Dr. Devi is actually the Chief Immunization Specialist here at UNICEF IPRO, Bangkok, Thailand. Dr. Devi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sunny, um, for the, uh, the introduction. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, um, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, just want to welcome you to this um, the, this much needed uh, webinar on the digital health certificate. I realize that some of the countries have already gone ahead uh, with these certificates, um, but we really wanted to bring that technical um, uh, aspect um, and the and the policy and, and registration aspects um, uh, onto this uh, the the webinar and the considerations. So we're really lucky to have um, all our experts uh, presenting um, to all of you on these aspects. And I want to extend the, um, uh, uh, our appreciation to DICE, um, as well as our partners, WHO, and um, uh, those organizing this in, uh, in the UNICEF um, um, offices for this webinar. Um, as you all know, with COVID-19, uh, the digital transformation has been accelerated even faster than ever uh, at an unprecedented rate. Um, and it's actually an opportunity to use this um, to, to uh, accelerate um, uh, the digital aspects of health, um, not only for the health certificates, but other aspects as well, which I think will be talked about in this webinar as well. Um, the thing is that the investment in digital health, including uh, the, the health certificate, um, need to be thought through and planned carefully to make sure that it's not a one-time solution, that all aspects are considered and that there could be sustainability and other uses afterwards as well. There is global guidance, which can be used for the countries to review the current plan um, for this initiative. And as you will hear later on from our presenters, the, there is 
huge opportunity of support um, uh, to uh, yourselves, to the countries, to the country offices um, from DICE um, uh, for any digital solution for the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, as well as for the COVID response. So once again, thank you for taking the time um, to be on this webinar. And without further ado, um, I'll hand it back to Sunny um, for the, uh, the, the next agenda item. Thank you very much. For that excellent presentation. And I think uh, we are going to dive in straight into the technical sections without wasting further time. And um, I'm going to call on the WHO team, Nat and Carl, to take uh, the floor. And uh, Nat and Carl, they're actually you know, technical officers at the WHO Geneva, and uh, they work with the Digital Health Innovation Department and uh, will be working us to some of the key technical requirements on establishing the COVID-19 digital certificates. Carl and Nat, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Sunny. Um, if we could go on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so apologies if those of you were on the call yesterday, um, so this might be a bit of a repeat, but essentially just to set the context and the challenges surrounding the COVID certificate work, um, it might seem a bit simple in a sense where we want a digital version of your certificate, but it gets quite challenging, especially with the need to verify all those certificates. Um, so at the global level, there's really an inconsistency in terms of the data collected and ability standards used. And this is what we're hoping to address with the DDCC document, um, which outlines the technical specifications for interoperability standards, as well as a minimum data set that we recommend countries using. Um, and of course, there's also the policy gaps that really is evolving as the COVID-19 pandemic evolves and the policies around travel as the epidemiological status of each country changes. So there's always changing policies, which makes the digital quite difficult to implement. Um, and I think lastly, which is a really important point is oftentimes the conversation around COVID certificates is the desire to have a certificate issued in one country be recognized anywhere else in the world. And of course, there are technological challenges when it comes to this in terms of interoperability standards and verification mechanisms. But I think it's also important to note that um, the technology does exist and it's really more about the policy gaps and the governance around this work. Um, and so global standards really require global cooperation. It requires countries to agree with each other about what the verification requirements are and agree upon a set of um, data standards to use, um, which isn't here yet. Um, and so that leads to a lot of challenges faced by individual governments where there are numerous competing products that all work in its own right. But again, it's not necessarily able to be verified everywhere. There's also a lack of criteria for assessment for countries to use. And we're hoping that the DDCC document helps guides countries for that. Um, and there's also a number of standards. So I know WHO has a standard and we've tried to incorporate to ensure that that actually covers the standards published by ICAO, as well as the UDCC, as well as others that have already been implemented in countries. But the reality is because there is no um, global health trust framework of any sort to verify, there are multiple standards in terms of verification as well. And so that's where countries really have to decide to adopt one standard or potentially all those standards to ensure that their certificates can be recognized everywhere. Um, and then the other thing too is in the COVID pandemic, there has been a lot of investments where countries want to invest in digital, but it's really a strategic decision that countries do have to make if they want to have something that is immediate for the short term that addresses COVID, or if they're willing to really invest in systems that can interoperate with existing systems in countries. And that's definitely something that WHO recommends following existing guidance is to ensure that any investments that are made in country for digital health solutions really do think about the long term and ensure that these systems can interoperate with existing digital solutions in countries. Um, and lastly, at the individual level, I think all of us on the call have had some experience with this already, but there is a lot of um, restrictions that countries are putting in place, which may or may not be advised or well advised by ethical or data protection principles. Um, there's also potential for a lot of fraudulent paper and digital certificates. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about when, where, how these things should be used, especially when in the international travel context. And so there needs to be clear communication from countries about what the policies are in this regard as well. 
to reduce that individual level confusion. Next slide, please. And so the objectives of the DDCC document, um, which we've published for vaccination status in August, and we'll be publishing for test results um, in quarter one of next year, is to really publish implementable specifications and standards for data, functionality, and natural trust architectures for the specific use cases of continuity of care or proof of vaccination, um, and to develop guidance that details key considerations for those governance um, and policy considerations, ethical design principles, and implementation best practices and how to potentially link that to either national or international trust architectures. And lastly, to ensure that the design of the DDCC is done in an equitable way. Um, with any digital technology and any digital development, there's always the high risk that these digital solutions will end up preventing and other people who might not have access to digital technologies from going into day-to-day -day life. And so we don't want that to happen. And to also ensure that there's no vendor lock-in, because again, there are a lot of vendors out there in the market right now. And of course, this is a great market opportunity for them, but countries do have to be aware that sometimes making those decisions to, on a specific vendor might lead them to be stuck with that vendor for the long term. Um, next slide. And so the DDCC technical specifications and implementation guidance documents um, will be a series of two documents. One is the vaccination status that has been published. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, is continuity of care. So the continuity of care use case is more like the traditional home-based record where an individual should have the right to their record in a digital format and to be um, able to access their records, to, be, to know when their next dose should be, um, to know whether or not they need a booster dose, for example, and that's really part of their own personal health record. Um, the other one is proof of vaccination. This is the more, I guess, popular or more often talked about use case where you use proof of vaccination to either enter into public spaces or to travel. And so that's one guidance document. And right now we're building on top of that and including a guidance document on DDCC test results. And so that would include SARS-CoV-2 negative test results as well as proof of previous infection, um, which is essentially a positive test result. Next slide, please. And so I won't read through all of this, but essentially the design of the specifications and the implementation guidance in the DDCC guidance documents were based on a series of ethical and privacy considerations. Um, as mentioned earlier, key principle of ours was to ensure that the technical specifications leverage open standards so, so that they don't increase health inequities and they don't lead to vendor lock-in. Um, the other big consideration was in terms of the format of the DDCC to ensure that it is digital, but it can also be accessible on a paper format so the, that individuals without smartphones don't have to rely on that ability to access a smartphone to have a certificate. Um, and then the other thing I do want to highlight is ensuring that the technology is as environmentally friendly as possible. Oftentimes we don't talk about this in digital development, but there are a lot of technologies out there right now, such as blockchain, for example, that uses a lot of electricity more so than other pre-existing technologies. And so I think it's important that countries are mindful of that when they choose the specific technology to implement these solutions um, and to ensure that they do have the capacity to meet those needs, the electricity needs if they so choose to do that um, solution. Next slide, please. And so just to highlight um, illustratively what we mean by paper first augmented by digital, on the top you see two kind of traditional vaccine certificates, so the yellow card, as well as a home-based record. Um, but really when we're talking about DDCC or digital documentation of that, um, it's essentially, it could be a paper with a QR code on it that links to a digital record, or it's a PDF document, or it's um, held on a smartphone through a specific app. Next slide, please. And so what's actually in the guidance document? Um, so it's really not a policy document, but it's a technical specifications document that has workflows, use cases, core data elements, require, functional and non-functional requirements, an overview of digital signing um, with PKI technology, and as well as a linked fire implementation guide that details the interoperability standards for this work. Um, and the implementation considerations, again, it's up to the member state to decide how they want to implement it, but we do provide 
data protection principles and ethical considerations, as well as governance considerations. Next slide, please. And so the assumption for countries is really that countries based on their population have to decide if they want to implement the COVID certificates on a paper format or a PDF or a smartphone application. They also have to decide again, if they wanna create a new point of service solution to register individuals uh, for COVID vaccines or tests, or if there's an existing solution they can leverage. Um, and the third is really the policies. Again, this is really critical and often a prerequisite before digital to ensure that countries implement the governance policies required to responsibly use these certificates, as well as ensuring there are privacy protection mechanisms in place. Um, and again, the DDCC document isn't intended to be an ID document. I think this is often conflated when discussing digital certificates and verifiable credentials. Um, but DDCCs are really supposed to be a digital representation of health content. And so it's really up to the countries if they want to bind that certificate to an identity document. And if so, um, it's really up to the country again to decide what means of identity they would want to use for that. And lastly, it's up to the countries to decide which trust frameworks they want to engage in for validation of the certificates. For example, in the EU, there is a um, prerequisite, a criteria that the EU accepts for third countries to join their trust framework. Um, other countries are engaging in other regional or bilateral networks. And so again, it's up to the countries to decide how they want to engage and what rules they want to follow, essentially. Next slide, please. Um, so here is where I'll hand off to my colleague, Carl, to go into a bit more details about the technical content. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you, um, Nat, Sunny, and um, for the opportunity to speak today. So the talk through some more of the technical details and the, the, um, the standards related to the digital documentation of COVID certificates. Um, um, so first of all, we, on the left, we're starting with a vaccination certificate that is used to document vaccination events. Um, these vaccination events can also be used for routine immunizations for children. Um, right with the DDCC or digital documentation of COVID certificates specification, we're only focused in non-COVID. However, the infrastructure um, and the architecture in place, the standards in place, really support broader use cases outside of COVID. So, um, uh, and then investment into DDCC is also an investment into a larger set of use cases. Um, the, the DDCC supports both the vaccination events as well as the test results um, that, um, that mentioned that guidance is now in, out for public comment. Um, and the test results are used for the uh, history of previous COVID infections as well as a, a negative test. Um, both of the vaccination and uh, test result certificates can um, be incorporated into a personal health record for continuity of care scenarios and are both based on the International Patient Summary Standard, which is a HL7 fire standard um, for providing summary of health information to be used both within a country as across borders. Um, and the, the IPS standard includes other um, information such as um, risk factors, allergies, uh, other diagnostic test results. And so really this COVID certificates are a part of um, the, the IPS. Next slide, please. Um, there are a number of initiatives that are out um, that provides COVID certificates. Um, the EU has the digital COVID certificates. There's DIVOC, which we'll be hearing about later. Uh, smart health cards that's used in the US and Canada and lack pass that's used in um, the Latin America region. Um, for example, each of these has a QR code that um, provides a, a way to encode the uh, vaccination or test result status in, into that QR code, as well as a, a trust network that they define. Um, the WHO DDCC is in, intended to provide an umbrella specification for these COVID certificates that already exist. It does not provide a, a specific QR code specification. Rather, it shows how um, various QR code specifications can be produced from a HL7 FHIR document um, and referenced um, 
this uh, HL7 fire document provides a common data model and, and that support for the, those multiple codes. Um, in addition, um, we're working on extending and generalizing the EU's DCC gateway, its trust network, uh, into a, a more federated regional and or national trust network. And so uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. So next slide, please. Um, to give you an idea of, of what's in the DDCC specification, and particularly the, the fire implementation guide, um, is it describes the different types of actors um, that need to exist um, to um, produce uh, COVID certificates. So starting on the left, you see a digital health solution. This is a solution that might be deployed in a facility or at a community level that's um, tracking and managing immunization, vaccination um, um, events, uh, perhaps as a vaccination campaign, or is used to capture and manage test results. Um, this digital health solution can submit a, a health event, such as a vaccination event, into a certificate generation service. And that certificate generation service is responsible for taking the, the questionnaire of information that was submitted by the digital health solution and produce the one or more QR codes in the signed fire document. Um, once it's produced that document, it can um, it needs to register it with a, a, a DDCC registry service, which provides uh, metadata as to when the uh, um, certificate was generated, um, if it's still valid, if it hasn't been revoked, um, uh, but doesn't contain any actual health content. Um, optionally, the DDCC generation service can um, store the actual DDCC document in a repository, in which case that information could be retrieved later. Um, the last actor that we have is a status checking app, which could be used, for example, um, by uh, uh, in a clinical context by a provider to determine what the previous immunizations are or by a, a um, border control agent wanting to learn the vaccination or um, test status of a, of a person. Um, that status checking application can either scan the QR code and verify that it's not fraudulent and the information that's in there in the offline manner or an online manner, in which case it goes to the registry service to check that the certificate is still valid um, and not hasn't been revoked. And if it needs to retrieve more current information, uh, it can go to the repository um, and retrieve current test results and vaccination information. Next slide, please. The DDCC specification um, and the technical infrastructure was designed, designed with the OpenHIE architecture in mind. Um, you can see on the bottom row, the, the point of service solutions and the OpenHIE architecture uh, in this place, the role of the digital health solution that we saw on the previous slide. The certificate generation service, which is responsible for generating the certificates and signing them, is a service within the interoperability layer. And the um, uh, DDCC registry, and uh, sorry, DDCC repository is played by the shared health record at the top middle. Um, and the registry is, the, is there as an external service along with the national um, public key directory. The, the DDCC registry is um, a service that's considered external because it um, provides information both within the, the jurisdiction of the member state as well as perhaps to other um, countries for cross-border purposes and has really limited um, and no information and no clinical information. Uh, the DDCC specification was also designed with the registry services um, such as terminology services, facility and health worker registries and product catalogs in mind um, to help validate the information that's being sent um, in, um, in a uh, certificate. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to give an overview of some of the timelines. Um, so uh, we already have the, the guidance documentation um, published for the vaccination status. Uh, and there's a draft HL7 fire implementation guide. And we'll put the links that are in the slide in, in the chat in just a moment. Um, as Nat had mentioned, we also have a uh, draft for public comment release of the test results uh, 
digital documentation and COVID certificates, um, which is uh, out for public comment until November 29th. So please review, um, provide your feedback. Uh, your feedback will help make the test result specification stronger and can ensure that it's meeting as many needs um, as possible. And also please feel free and share this within your network so that we, we can get um, even more feedback. Our estimated publication date um, for this is around January 31st. Um, um, next, I just want to talk through some of the reference implementation and tooling. Um, we already have a um, certificate generation service available um, as for beta use and it has synthetic data. This is a, a, a mediator that can operate in open HIM um, interoperability layer. Um, it's a reference implementation of OpenHIE. Um, the addition of test results um, to the certificate generation service is expected in January, along with the release of the, the updated documentation, guidance documentation. Um, we are currently um, working to uh, develop a DDCC gateway. That's part of the public key infrastructure, in particular the public key directory. Um, exchanging of the keys that are used to sign the certificates. Uh, that's expected by the end of the year. Um, and it generalizes the EU DCC gateway um, for um, a more federated trust networks that could be operated at a national or regional level. Um, the, um, with the idea that, that there are different trust networks out there, um, might want to interoperate with different um, rules and policies as um, that might differ from those set by the EU. Um, we're also uh, working on a DDCC universal status checking app, which will scan in various QR codes, such as the EU DDCC, the DIVAHOC, the smart health cards, um, and uh, map those onto the, the DDCC HL7 fire data model, um, and which uh, different member state rules about validation of uh, vaccinations or test results can be easily modified and um, applied. Um, that's expected again as a beta and by the end of the year and is using the Google Android Fire SDK. Uh, finally, there's a um, digital health solution that can report the immunization health event. Um, uh, as part of OpenSRP Fire Core, um, and, um, and that's available as well. Um, finally, just want to mention there is a HL7 Fire Connectathon coming up in January, in which we'll be looking at the interoperability of the DDCC specification, the International Patient Summary, and Smart Health Cards. Um, there's certainly opportunity to expand this to other. Um, um, QR code specifications as well, and this will help to ensure that we have interoperability. So, um, next slide, and thank you um, for the opportunity to participate. Right, thank you so much, uh, Nat and Carl, for the excellent uh, presentation. And uh, once more, participants, we encourage you to, you know, go use the Q and A section to put in your uh, questions there. Nat and Carl are available online to iteratively answer your questions that you may have, you know, so you can chat, put the, chat, the questions there and they attend to it right away. Also, we can actually, you know, come back to these questions at the end of the entire presentation. But that was an excellent, you know, technical overview of what it takes, the policies, the requirements and the regulations for establishing the digital certificates. And I was glad when uh, Carl said there are you know, different digital certificates in the marketplace for which countries can choose from, which you know, WHO and UNICEF are actually available to guide you know, on what they are choosing. But on this call, we have the country, uh, uh, Philippines, joining us to share their country experience regarding what they have chosen, their experiences, and how have they been faring with what you know they have done so far in this uh, discussion? So I'll be welcoming on board uh, the country office representative Dave Palmores to come and you know tell us walk us through the experiences on this uh, certificate so far. And um, let me also tell us that 
and Dave actually has been, um, Dave is a project manager working with Vasat Page. He has more than seven uh, years experience in implementing some of these uh, global goods for countries. He graduated from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines since uh, 2013, and ever since then has been supporting you know, the government on digital documentation of the COVID-19 vaccines. Dave, please, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sunny. Um, so I am the project manager of Vaccine Peach, and I'll be presenting our experience um, with this initiative. So um, Vaxert Page is basically the official digital vaccination certificate of the, of the Philippines. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, for uh, the proof of vaccination status in the Philippines, what has uh, happened is that before we have established the Vaxert Page, the specific LGUs or local government units here in the Philippines, the cities and municipalities have been issuing their um, own vaccination cards. So those are in paper form, and um, it doesn't have it doesn't really comes from a central database. Uh, it it comes from I mean the data that are being printed on those cards are coming from the separate systems that the LGUs are using. So. Uh, the problem is that uh, to allow the mobility and travel of our people uh, and, and, and their entry into the foreign countries, because most of our people uh, who are traveling abroad, abroad are OFWs or what we call uh, overseas Filipino workers, they would need um, an international, inter internationally recognized certificate uh, for them to present it as proof of their, their vaccination status. So the vaccine cards that the local government units are issuing are not really uh, that uh, official. So um, it's also uh, subjected to uh, falsification and it can be easily destroyed. That's why we have um, implemented the vaccine page as a form of the proof of vaccination status for uh, our citizens. So as mentioned, um, Vaxit PH is our uh, representation of vaccination status. And it's just not for the citizens of the Philippines, it's also for the non-Filipino citizens that were vaccinated in the Philippines. So I'm, I'm sharing a sample as well of our certificate here. And um, basically the certificate can be accessed by the citizens through a self-service portal. So we have created a website wherein the, the people can go to and generate their um, certificates. So this certificate is secured by a public private key uh, with QR code that is verifiable online or offline. So uh, in the certificate, we have, we have this QR code and it can be uh, verified uh, whether you are online or offline through the scanning facility that we also have, um, specific scanning facility. So in, in our portal, we have that, that scanning uh, feature to uh, scan the QR code. And also we have um, released mobile applications as well, specifically to verify the backseat page in, in iOS and Android versions. So for the other built-in scanners, this will not be able to they will not be able to um, verify the details of the QR code. So it should be the either the mobile application or the scanning facility that can be found in the Vaxit PH website. So um, the information that are being pulled out and displayed in the certificate are basically coming through the what we call line list records that were submitted by the local government units. And those are stored in the VIMS. VIMS is uh, like our central database repository for, for all of the vaccination um, events that's happening um, in the Philippines. So it's the, the vaccine information management system. <clears throat> and really the purpose of Vaxit PH is for um, international travel. And that is the what we have communicated before, but then um, since many of the LGUs have already um, announced that they will accept Vaxit PH 
in lieu of RT-PCR test, then it's basically the Baxter PH is being used as well as a proof of vaccination status when traveling inside the country. So um, Vaxit PH is compliant with the DDCC guidelines um, because we want it to be internationally recognized and accepted in foreign jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So this is the, the Vaxit PH portal um, and it's a self-service portal as mentioned wherein the people can go to generate their uh, digital vaccination certificate or DPC. This is where uh, they can use as well the, the verification um, feature or the scanning facility to, to specifically scan the QR code of vaccine page. And in cases of um, people who are we're not able to find their records because this these records are coming from L LGUs. They're the ones submitting it to the center database. Um, there will be instances that they will not that the LGUs will not be able to uh, upload um, their uh, the vaccination records of the uh, vaccination that they have administ administered in their in their areas. So there could be instances wherein the, the records are missing. So there will be a facility as well for the for the citizens to submit a request. And those requests will be routed to the LGUs for correction and uploading of those missing vaccination records. Next slide, please. So this is how the information flows from the time uh, of the, the vaccination, the, the information is gathered from the vaccine at the vaccination sites um, through a physical form, or uh, right now we have also deployed a mobile application that the LGUs can use to gather information and um, encode it in, the, in, the, in that specific application. Or uh, some of the LGUs has, uh, have their own systems uh, wherein they can directly input the, the information of their vaccinees. So from there, since it's a different, it, it, uh, the, the data are gathered in different formats and in different systems, they need to submit it to the central database. So it could be, uh, it should be manually encoded or uh, downloaded into what we call a line list template to upload those records into the central database, which is uh, VIMS. And that is where the information is stored. And that is where the vaccine PH gets the information to print out the digital vaccination certificate. So next slide, please. So uh, I think I've already mentioned about this. So um, the LGUs have been issuing uh, their uh, vaccine cards, physical vaccine cards. So, um, it's subject to uh, loss or easily, they will be easily destroyed and can be easily falsified. And it's not really a proof of uh, uh, vaccination status for international travel. So that's why we have um, established and created Baxter PH. Next slide, please. So this is uh, our timeline for uh, the launching of the Baxter PH. Since September 6th, we have launch it, uh, we, we ha only had a soft launch. So it's uh, basically rolled out to just selected um, areas in those that uh, those cities that are surrounding um, Manila. And what we have prioritized are international travelers and overseas Philippin Filipino, Filipino workers where we, while we are um, mm, uh, trying to uh, gradually roll out vaccine PH throughout the country. And then um, in September 27, we had a wave to launch and the rollout expanded to the other regions and cities within the Philippines. And on November 3, um, there was a res resolution from our health authority that the vaccine PH will be already, can be already used for domestic purposes. That's why um, the, the LGUs, some of the LGUs have already announced that the vaccine page can be used in lieu of the RT-PCR test. So basically, it's being used as well um, in the movement of our, or of our citizens within the country. So next slide, please. 
So this is our nationwide statistics and um, this is uh, already outdated since <laughs> it's uh, as of November 17, but uh, I can give you a, uh, a figure for uh, as of yesterday. So it's already 2.1 uh, million certificates that we have generated for each of those uh, individuals who have requested their certificate in the portal. And this is just uh, showing that, that the other screenshots is showing the certificates that were generated for each of the regions in the in the country. And basically all of most of the most of the certificates or uh, requestors came from the, the national capital region or um, the oh, where in the, the Manila resides, the region where, where Manila resides. Okay, next slide, please. So um, these are the, the VAC cert PH boots that were established by the local government units in their own cities and uh, municipalities. So the boots were um, uh, established or uh, uh, there because uh, some of our citizens doesn't have any access to internet or uh, mobile devices or they uh, some of them would not be uh, technically uh, capable to request for their own certificate. So uh, the booths are there for uh, the assistance uh, of, of their own constituents in terms of generating their DPCs and also um, submitting their, their requests in case um, their records are not found or something that needs to be updated in their records. So those uh, booths are uh, located in uh, most of the LGUs and cities that we have in the Philippines. Next slide, please. And uh, these are uh, more booths. So it's not just in the in the LGUs. Um, it's also uh, a place in malls. So there are booths uh, that were also uh, placed in malls so that people could easily go, go there and ask for uh, assistance in generating their DPCs. So what's next for, for Vaxxer PH? Um, right now, since we have already started the uh, vaccination for the booster shots and third dose, uh, we are already uh, developing the, the Vaxxer PH to accommodate the issuance of the certificates certificate that includes the third dose details or booster shot details as well. And in terms of interoperability with the other specs, uh, since Philippines is using the, the DIVOC platform no? um, and uh, we are uh, helped by our partners with India here uh, to also create the Vaxxer PH and the generation of its certificate. Um, we are also planning to be compliant with the EU DCC um, guidelines, as well as its own term operability with the other uh, digital travel wallet apps like Ayata, um, AOK Pass, and also Affinity, and others. So that's it for our um, experience uh, in the Philippines for Vaxxer Beach. Thank you for having uh, me to present the Vaxxer Beach for you guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. You know, Dave, for that, you know, excellent of our, you know, the implementation of the VAXATS, the DIVOC platform, and the WHO EU, you know, technical guidelines in your country. We there are so many burning questions. Is either you use the uh, chat box to chat your questions so that alternatively public presenters can actually address your questions or at the end, you know, we can actually go take, you know, QIA sections, but because of the take of time, it's best to type your questions using the QIA you know, box at the bottom of your screen. Please, let's uh, do that. And next we'll be, you know, going to the last presentation of today, which will be, you know, taken by Dr. Sean. So Sean is actually a digital uh, development specialist with more than 20 years experience advising government and other development partners on health system strengthening, health information systems and national digital health uh, programs. He is also one of the co-founders of the UNICEF WHO uh, Digital Health Center of Excellence at DICE and currently works as the regional technical 
uh, technical development business analyst for the Eastern and Southern uh, Africa in, in the uh, region. Uh, Sean, please, the floor is yours. Great, Sonny, thank you very much and a pleasure to be joining today. Uh, so just wanted to give uh, some quick background on a new technical assistance mechanism launched uh, uh, midway through last year called DICE, the Digital Health Center of Excellence. Uh, this is uh, being co-led by UNICEF and WHO. Next slide, please. So, you know, um, while, while, while DICE is looking at uh, broader health system strengthening and the role of digital within it, uh, we do see COVID-19 as uh, an opportunity uh, to make uh, smart, well-informed investments uh, that can strengthen and build more resilient health systems. Uh, and so again, as we, we, we look at things like the um, smart vaccination cards, we look at uh, vaccine scheduling, we look at uh, reminders. I would, I would uh, ask all of our um, colleagues at uh, global, regional and country level to think about the bigger picture uh, and, and, and how we can use these investments uh, to, uh, uh, to, to ensure that immunization programs and, 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 and larger um, health programs programs uh, are being uh, properly invested in and supported. Next slide. So um, with, with, with DICE, there are a couple of key principles we are looking to support as we're providing technical assistance. Uh, first is ensuring that we're focusing on evidence-based uh, approaches and well-tested global or digital public goods uh, that uh, uh, have been deployed in other country contexts where we know uh, they have been able to be effectively deployed. Um, we want to ensure that all support is done uh, in alignment uh, with the um, NDVPs as well as the broader uh, health sector um, strategic plans and investment plans in the countries. Again, we don't want to see COVID-19 uh, digital investments to be done uh, as verticals, uh, but, but, but really built into to, to national country strategies. And finally, um, just wanted to note that um, DICE is not a funding mechanism, uh, but we work very closely with, with many that are, with, uh, with the Global Fund, with Gavi, uh, with the World Bank and others. Um, whereas DICE really looks to uh, provide uh, coordination uh, and quality assurance across donors and other implementing partners uh, and technical assistance uh, to, uh, to country teams themselves. Next slide. So, you know, we heard today uh, around uh, number two, vaccination status. Um, this is one of eight areas that we've identified as priorities uh, for, for DICE support, but also looking at uh, everything from service delivery planning or um, uh, micro planning using, using uh, geospatial um, uh, applications, uh, counterfeit detection. Uh, we're working closely with the Global Trust Repository uh, on, on this. Uh, community mobilization, uh, addressing vaccine hesitancy through our risk communication and community engagement programs, uh, supporting logistics management, LMIS uh, type platforms, uh, coverage monitoring, um, often with platforms like DHIS2, uh, remote health worker learning, and then finally health service delivery, uh, which covers everything from vaccination um, scheduling um, and uh, re you know, registration and scheduling all the way through um, monitoring uh, second, second doses and uh, related outcomes. Uh, next slide. So the, ty the types, or sorry, before we even get to that, um, just wanted to note uh, um, the, the larger consortium of DICE, DICE partners. And so, um, you know, I mentioned that UNICEF and WHO uh, co-chair the secretariat, uh, but we also have, again, a, a larger uh, set of, of partners that we're collaborating with uh, very, very closely. Everybody from, from Gavi, Gates Foundation, Digital Square, USAID, CDC, uh, the World Bank, FCDU, and the uh, GIZ in the EU. Next slide. And then I uh, wanted to, 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 to kind of uh, round up on uh, round off on two slides before we turn over very quickly to the Q and A um, on what areas, what is the, what is the technical assistance uh, that, that is offered through DICE? Um, as again, I previously mentioned, uh, we are focusing on coordinating our technical assistance between donors at regional and global level uh, so that uh, whether you are 
uh, receiving support from WHO or USAID or GIZ at a country level. Uh, that support should be uh, consistent uh, and of high quality. Uh, and it, it shouldn't really matter which, which donor you're, uh, you're, you're approaching or working with, uh, knowing that uh, the kind of full weight of the DICE consortium partners should be uh, available and ready to, to, to provide assistance. Uh, where we're pr um, currently supporting is reviewing uh, concept notes, TORs, business requirements, proposals, uh, investment cases, uh, ensuring that they're of high quality, that they're strategic, uh, and that they're aligned again with national plans and strategies. Uh, we're providing guidance and support to the identification um, and implementation of assessment tools. Uh, we very much uh, want to ensure that countries know where they're at in terms of digital readiness. Uh, they know what is possible to implement today and what they need to invest in uh, to, to, to really be in a good position uh, to have a end-to-end -end, um, fully digitized uh, health system in the years to come. Uh, we're also providing support on uh, developing business requirements uh, at country level and then matching them against um, uh, mature digital um, global goods or digital public goods, uh, ensuring that again you're you're identifying you're you're, you're able to consider um, a a set of solutions uh, that are uh, best fit for your specific country needs. Um, we also have a um, a pool of uh, both uh, technical consultants on roster, which we can deploy relatively quickly, uh, as well um, as we're building up a roster of. Um, organizations, INGOs, CSOs, academic partners uh, that uh, can be engaged uh, again directly at, at, at uh, regional or country level. And then finally, supporting capacity building, training, and knowledge management. Uh, final slide. Oh, let's, let's, let's actually skip this slide um, and go to, yeah. Uh, so how can support be requested? Um, I would suggest a couple of different ways. Um, first and foremost, uh, I, I would say uh, bullet point two, um, make sure that uh, the, the, the request for technical assistance are coming from or endorsed by relevant government parties uh, and that they have gone through existing um, coordinating mechanisms. Uh, again, um, you know, it's, it's great if, if, if development partners, if donors reach out uh, for, for technical assistance, but, but, but we very much wanna make sure uh, that uh, the, the requests are um, government owned and, and led. Um, as part of this, we wanna ensure that they are again, aligned with the NDVPs and other global funding mechanisms like uh, the C19RM, uh, and Gavi CDS. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, just wanted to note um, the contact, the email address up top. Um, once you've checked boxes two and three, um, feel free to reach out either through your country, UNICEF, WHO teams, or directly through uh, the contact um, email above. Uh, and DICE would be providing support again through uh, the regional uh, and uh, country UNICEF, WHO, and DICE consortium partner structures. Thank you very much. And back over to you, Sonny. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for that you know, excellent you know, uh, overview of the supports that are available to countries. So participants, this is time for Q&A. I didn't see any questions so far in the chat box. And um, I may just have to ask a broad question while you, you know, while I call upon one or two persons to ask, you know, focal questions. Uh, so uh, that goes to you, uh, Dave. What would be one single advice you give to any country here present on this call regarding uh, establishing the uh, digital certificates? Any country that is planning towards institutionalizing this uh, digital certificate, what would be one single advice you, you know, from lessons learned, from experiences uh, doing this in your country? So, what advice, just in a minute, will you give to such, you know, a country, a person, a representative here present in this call? Dave, please. Well, uh, for our for the vaccine page, I think uh, the lessons learned for us is really <clears throat> um, it should be well communicated. I mean that the, the rollout of vaccine page and its usage and its purpose should be well communicated to um, to our constituents and also uh, to the people who will be needing needing it for for their travel or for other purposes. I think that's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions from any of the participants? 
We can take one or two questions before we hand the floor back to David to close us out. We have three minutes to the end of the time. Any questions from any participants? You can unmute and speak. Okay, that's fine. I believe the presenters had done so well and we are very explanatory and uh, in communicating what's you know, actually we needed to know about this topic. And also let me also tell us that we are going to make the you know, webinar materials available for everyone, both the video, the slides, the uh, Q and A, those that came from yesterday. And today we are going to match everything together and make it publicly available for you know colleagues to listen, read through, and go through, and you know keep you know seeing how they can move this forward in their countries. Uh, so with that, we are going to uh, wrap up this section. I'm going to hand the floor back to our chief, uh, Dr. Devi, to give us the closing remarks before we close uh, end today's uh, section. Dr. Devi, please. Thank you so much, Sonny. Uh, thank you to um, all the presenters um, uh, again um, for all their, um, uh, their, their expert um, technical advice and guidance, and also to the Philippines colleagues for, for sharing their um, uh, experience um, and the lessons learned from, from, from the field and in, in one of the countries. Um, so again, I want to thank uh, um, a huge appreciation for our DICE and WH and UNICEF and other partners for, for putting this uh, webinar together. Um, and as you know, DICE and, and, and all our partners and, uh, and us are on full swing to support the countries to access and roll out these COVID-19 vaccines to, to strengthen the cold chain capacities, to counter misinformation, um, and also issue verifiable digital vaccination certificates, uh, DDCCs, among other important areas of the COVID responses. Um, again, you know, I, I mentioned this in the opening um, remarks that there is a huge demand for digital solutions um, in responding to this COVID, um, both for just the COVID response as well as the COVID-19 uh, vaccine rollout. Um, and we've also uh, talked about how we need to think further on the, um, the building more resilient health systems and ensure that the gains for which we have fought long and hard do not slide back. Um, there is an increasing demand for countries to provide uh, digital uh, DDCC um, to vaccinated individuals. And this rapid scale up of this digital transformation, it could be further adapted for other routine immunization um, and broader essential health services. And, the, and, and the, there needs to be a, a think through to make sure that this transformation is uh, carried over into other aspects of the, um, the, the health services as well in developing this more resilient health systems. Um, so again, I would like to thank everyone on this webinar um, for taking the time and we hope that uh, everything that you learned um, and discussed on this forum, this webinar will be taken forward in, in, in the country discussions and in providing further support um, to the countries um, in, in um, making this a reality and, uh, uh, and in going forward as well. And I'm sure that our partners uh, and us in DICE are um, here to support um, all the needs um, all, all your needs uh, regarding this um, as well, as uh, Sean has uh, presented um, uh, previously. So again, thank you everyone um, for all your work um, and for this uh, attending this webinar and presenting as well. Um, have a good evening, um, afternoon and morning. Uh, have a good day to the rest of you. Thank you, back to Sunny. Right, thank you so much, Devi. And with that excellent closing remarks, we come to the end of this uh, two-day webinar, and we are happy that you all was able to join us. You're on top of R, and apologies for taking a minute past the R. Thank you so much, and do have a great day, a great evening, and a great afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you, and bye-bye.